it was my first time. Killing, I mean. I'm so sorry, I said to her, before plunging the knife multiple times in her chest and stomach. She gargled and spat out her own blood. It took longer than I first thought, a couple of minutes really, before she finally stopped breathing and her eyes stayed still. I guess her age would be somewhere between 25 and 45, but because of her rough situation, it was hard to tell for sure. I waited by her body until they showed up, which also took longer than I expected. I should have chosen a more populated area than this alleyway and a more decent hour of the day. At least there would have been more people around to witness the crime. But it didn't matter too much. I know I did it. And there's plenty of evidence here to support that fact too. It was 4.15 a.m. So I knew it wouldn't be long before the streets were full of working type. Strolling to the jobs like the good people should. I sat next to her lifeless body. Blood soaked knife still in my hand. And waited. I could have walked to the nearest payphone and called the cops myself. But I didn't want to leave the scene. You know, just in case. She was mine to claim, no one else's. And I didn't want to screw up my opportunity by leaving the scene. As I stared into her soulless eyes, I imagined what it'd be like to be home again. Needless to say, I got caught. I don't even know who phoned it in, but someone must have. At about 7.45 a.m., the patrol car finally passed by us, slowly and with a shining light. They hit the brakes when they saw my blood encrusted hands. The two officers were swift and smooth, and within seconds, I was handcuffed and put in the back of a patrol car. A few weeks later, the court proceeded with the trial and was shown all the evidence, including my confession. No one showed to the courts for her though. No family, no friends, no one. Turns out the woman was 38 years old, had been homeless for the last 20 years, and had absolutely no family ties to speak of. The court heard the case and returned a verdict of guilty. Yes. I sentenced you to 18 months, said the judge, and my face dropped. What? I thought to myself, no. I tried to be reckless while in there. I even started multiple fights hoping to lengthen my stay, but the warden wanted me gone. He wanted us all gone. After just eight months, I was released. I walked the streets again, like a little lost dog. My thoughts enraged by the broken system. This time, I'm going for a family. A family with people who actually care about them. A family that will be on the news and famous for about a week. This time, I'm going home for good. Halloween is the best holiday of the year. No, not because of sweets and costumes, but because of the excitement. Everyone is anticipating the coming holidays. No one more so than yours truly. You see, I'm a pumpkin farmer. It's a sort of family tradition at this point. Each generation has improved and upgraded the business, making it grow bigger and better every time. This year, it's my go. I've spent at least two years on this plan now, and it's going to make the biggest, best pumpkin patch you'll ever see. You see, my invention is a seed, but not just any seed. I've made them so that all they need to grow is a little soil and they'll be growing faster than a weed and manure. 
My pumpkins will be the best in the town. No one will stand a chance. Currently, it's Halloween night, and I'm waiting to try out my babies. This is what they are at this point. I have spent so long loving and nurturing them. I wait in my house for the first visitor to arrive. I hear the doorbell, and I go to open the door. I'm met by a lone girl, about 16 or 17, dressed in a short cheerleading dress covered in blood. Fake. I know real blood when I see it. And currently trying to discreetly hide the cigarette she was smoking. Trick or treat, she says, looking completely bored out of her mind. I smile at her, but she doesn't react, instead holding out her hand obviously gesturing for sweets. My smile doesn't falter as I give her a single chocolate piece nor when she huffs in annoyance and struts down my garden path, stopping only to flick her half-lit cigarette into my flower bed and to eat the chocolate piece I gave her. It doesn't even falter when she starts to choke and turns around in horror and confusion, showing the large pumpkin-sized lump in her stomach, slowly growing larger and larger with each terrified breath she takes. When she collapsed to the ground, the pumpkin having finally ruptured in her stomach and torn through her flesh, I smile even wider. My babies worked wonderfully. I turn to go back inside my house, but out the corner of my eye, I see a young boy walking up the path, candy bag in tow completely oblivious to the corpse just feet away from him hidden under a sea of vines in an island of pumpkins, smiling just as happily as I am. It seems I had another walking bag of soil up for grabs. I hold out my chocolate, my babies, excitement building as I imagine how big this pumpkin patch will be. Halloween really is the best holiday of the year. No one ever believed the playground was haunted before children suddenly started disappearing. First one, then two. After a month, the playground was left completely deserted. Ten children in total went missing in that wretched place. According to the witnesses, it was like they vanished into thin air. One moment they were there, and the next they were gone. The police didn't buy into the whole haunted playground concept, of course. It was obviously the doing of some perverted psychopath, some demented lunatic who tricked the poor kids into the back of some nondescript van. In other words, they completely disregarded every piece of factual evidence and launched a statewide investigation based on nothing but assumptions. They should have looked into the history of the plot where the playground was built. Everyone knew it. It wasn't a secret. Fifty years ago, a harrowing house stood where the playground is now. And in that house, housed a little boy that grew up to become a monstrous serial killer. The Clear Lake Strangler, they called him. He terrorized the country for years, killing at least a dozen children. He was never caught, but we all knew it was David. We could see it in his eyes. Pure unfiltered evil and that's why we burned down the house with him still in it sound asleep the town took over the plot and to erase their own blatant incompetence they quickly turned the smoking ruins tainted with the deaths of so many into a colorful vibrant playground they never publicly admitted that the clear lake strangler was under their noses the entire time of course but in turning something so detestable into such a fun and happy place, they might as well have. But now, 
it was tainted yet again. Some said it was the vengeful spirit of David himself haunting the playground, preying on the children of his murderers. Others claimed it was the lost souls of the Clear Lake Stranglers victims desperately looking for companionship in the afterlife. The police still wouldn't let go of the demented lunatic theory. They were all wrong, and they were all right. It was a coincidence, really. A father of a missing child couldn't cope with the presumed death of his beautiful boy and decided to end it where it all started, the playground. He tied the noose around a swing set, but the rope snapped as he dropped. To his surprise, he fell through the brittle concrete foundation into a dark cellar below. David never died in that fire. He was never in his bed. He hid in the cellar all these years. The father took him by surprise and was able to subdue him. They found the missing children in a surprisingly clean and lavishly decorated bedroom. They all looked so peaceful, even in death. Not a single scratch on them. When asked why he did it, David would always give the same answer. They just wanted someone to play with. 